1. It took place when I was 16. I lived in a small town next to the capital of Latvia, Riga. I like to stay in the woods a lot with my friend or alone, but after this shit I will never go back in the woods. It was summer, June to be exact. I and my friend wanted to go on a trip in the haunted woods near our hometown. We planned it for a long time and didn't think much about the haunted stuff, because we didn't really believe in that shit. But we still wanted to go. On the first day, we traveled to the National Park of Pocaini. We parked our car and started hiking 10 miles upriver to the camp. After five miles, we started to hear some noise coming from up ahead. We brushed it off, thinking it was some animal. When we reached the camp, it was empty. We placed our tents for the night and gathered some wood for a fire. It was late at that point, so we wanted to make something to eat and go to sleep. In the middle of the night, I heard something growling a few meters from my tent. I heard it scratching at a tree. Then I heard a light tap on my tent window behind me. I was scared shitless and didn't move, but I felt that someone or something was just staring at me and growling silently. Then I heard it speak. Quietly I heard it laugh and say something in a weird language. After that, I heard something walk away real slowly and giggling like a little girl. The next morning I was freaked the fuck out and wanted to get the fuck out of this forest. My friend agreed and we started the hike back to the car. About a mile into the hike, I noticed scratches on trees. They were deep and my friend started to freak out a little. But we continued on the road. After another mile or two, we hear a sound, like someone was screaming. About a mile in front of us, we looked at each other and didn't want to move anymore. We heard leaves shuffle behind us, but there was no one. We started to move on, but we had an uneasy feeling. When we got back to the car, we looked back to the forest and saw a dark figure walk away laughing like the day before. But the figure looked like it was a person with real long arms and legs. We fucking floored it and never went back. I know it may seem like a tale from some book, but from that day I have never went in the woods. I'm scared shitless to this day, because I have no clue what that was, and I don't plan to find out. 2. So before I can get to the meat of the story, I need to explain some things about this house. 1. This took place in 2007 in Kirkby, England. I live with my father, but on weekends would stay with my mum. 2. My mother's house had a downstairs bathroom, and due to my mother being too ill to get up the stairs, she would keep herself downstairs. This meant when I came on weekends, I had the upstairs to myself. I should note, this is a two-bedroom house, and I took the biggest room. 3. There were no other males around the house at the time of this event. It was just me, my mother, and her female friends staying over for a few nights. She herself staying downstairs to keep an eye on my mother due to her health. So to the meat of the story... It was an early Sunday morning. I can't remember the time, but I would guess around 1am or 2am. I, not having school due to the holidays, stayed up watching Cartoon Network. I remember a Ben 10 marathon going on. When I recall feeling uncomfortable at the time, it's hard to describe, but being 10 years older now, I describe it as a feeling of weight, a sort of pressure in the room that made it uncomfortable. I didn't really understand it, nor did I fear anything at the time. I just thought I was getting tired and thought, maybe it's time to get some sleep. I should note how odd this was as I am a night owl, and when not at school I would stay up as long as I wanted on weekends. So I switched off the TV, turned out the lights and got into bed facing the wall and closed my eyes. But I couldn't fall asleep. This feeling of weight continued to build. I remember getting goosebumps in my bed. Even now as I type this, I still get the goosebumps remembering what happened next. It was quiet. I had my eyes closed, then I heard it. 
a male voice quite stern right behind my head. Turn around. I froze up, eyes wide, as I stared at the wall. My mind raced at the thought of what was going on. Had someone broke into the house? Who was behind me? What would happen if I turned around? All of these thoughts flew from my head so fast looking back on this. I could have only been staring at my wall for no more than ten seconds. But it felt much longer. I remember turning around in my bed scared and looking around. Nothing. The room was dark and nothing in sight. No murderers or ghosts or random creature. I took the remote control and switched the TV on. Just wanting some light in my room just to feel comfortable. Cartoon Network came back on and the room was lit up a little by the TV. Enough to make me feel comfortable. I don't remember much after that. I remember not leaving the room for the entire night and falling asleep around 6am. Looking back on this, I find it strange. I wouldn't call myself religious by any means. I even looked back at it with a possible view I was halfway into a dream and that it was my mind that created it waking me up. All I know now is that I can't face a wall in bed without feeling the need to turn around in case there is something there. 3. So first a little background info. I live in Canada, BC, close to Okanoan Lake. Pretty decent sized lake, about 200 miles long or so. Me and my family are Native American. I grew up on an Indian reservation and all that. Off we drive up the hills, behind my grandfather's house. We could drive for, well, 10 or 12 plus hours up the mountains before seeing anyone. And even then, it's never a city, just hunting cabins, etc. Yet, we are not completely out of the boonies. If we drive the other way, 30 minutes or so, we are in a city with a population of 50,000 approximately. So me and all my family have been raised hunting and fishing. Every year my uncles get a couple deer and moose and maybe an elk. They don't eat it all themselves. They give at least half away to various family members, my mom, grandparents too old to hunt, etc. We all have big deep freezers to store the meat. Yet we never catch more than our family can eat, and never hunt if we already have plenty to eat. So what I'm saying is we all have plenty of bush and wildlife experience. More than most, even more than those who call themselves hunters. And I've seen tons of wildlife in my time. My family even more like wildlife sittings and encounters in the thousands if not tens of thousands. I couldn't even count the number of times I've seen a bear or deer or moose, or hell, more dangerous yet, a cougar, less than 50 feet from me. Most right beside one of my family's residents. And I've been close, like less than a dozen feet, from a mother bear with cubs. And I've been taught to know that it is the most dangerous situation you will ever be in. But maybe it was luck. Or I'd like to think mixed with a little knowledge and respect, and a healthy dose of fear. But whether it's just me or various friends and family members, we would slowly back away, raising our hands in submission, and keep talking, not yelling or intimidating, and slowly move the other way, making our apologies. I've had close encounters with cougars, and they are scarier yet, but same strategy, making yourself seem a little bigger and louder, and vacating that fucking area fast. So what I'm telling you is, me and my family have dealt with more wildlife than most, and got away unscathed. Hell, never even having a close call in over 50 to 75 plus years I know about. I just want it to be known, we only hunt to eat, that's it. Therefore we don't go hunting cougars or bears, as the eating's not that great, as most already know. But we're not above shooting a cougar or bear. If it's been well known to be stalking areas people, well, not so much people, but children, frequent. But honestly, in almost 50 years of living with wildlife and hunting, I can only recall one time we had to shoot a bear. Because he was getting into dozens of houses' garbage bins, and even a few locked vehicles. Then he was seen stalking on a fairly busy road, 
a mom and dad walking their infant in a stroller. Even then, he was given several more chances. Yet, was seen stalking around many family homes, looking for a target. So, with regret, he was taken out. Okay, so all this background is just to show me and my family and neighbours have dealt with wildlife for decades. Yet none of us, or anyone as far as I know, has ever seen or heard of a wild animal ever behaving in this way. Okay, sorry for the long intro, but I just wanted you all to know where I come from. So let's go back about three weeks to start. So even though we are out in the country, we do have a garbage pickup once per week. So every Monday, we put garbage bags in a garbage can out by the road in the morning, and it gets picked up shortly after. So three weeks ago, I brought my garbage can down the road at 6am. It gets picked up about 630 and obviously we do not want it out there too early, as it will attract animals. Yet later that day I went down there to put away the garbage can, even though it's empty the smell might attract animals. Then I was surprised to see the can on its side, and the bag ripped open, and strung everywhere. Everywhere. Okay, not unheard of out here, yet odd, as it's a fairly busy road at 6am to 6.30am. But whatever, I cleaned up and moved on. Next Monday, I waited as long as possible, maybe 6.25, to put out the garbage. And all was fine. So me and my household went about our typical business that day. Then about 6.45 in the morning, my two dogs, tiny little 5 to 10 pound inside dogs, were going crazy barking. At first I thought we had a visitor, as they do that when company comes over. But I looked outside and saw no vehicle in the driveway. Again, strange, but not unheard of. Maybe coyotes or even a deer close by, I thought. Then it happened, the loudest pounding I have ever heard on our front door like a huge 300-pound man, just pounding on the door with both fists. Okay, well, I should now state, even though most of my family are true hunters and fishermen, I am not. Well, I did hunt a few times, but really didn't like the idea of killing another being. Yes, yet I will buy a hamburger, call me a hypocrite, I know. I enjoy fishing, but not killing a large animal that can look at me with puppy dog eyes. Anyway, so this means I have no guns at my house. But at this point, I assumed it must be some crazed drug addicts attempting a home invasion. So I call the police. I hear tons of banging and noise, then silence. So I cautiously open the front door. Oh, so you need to know, we really have two front doors. We have a front door with a deadbolt for a front entrance more to take off snow-covered boots in winter, as well we have a full-size stand-up fridge freezer out there. More just a beer fridge and overflow food for outside get-together soon. Okay, booze parties with food. So I peer through a tiny crack in the second door, also locked with a deadbolt, and see no one, nothing around. But the outside fridge has its door ripped off its hinges. The freezer door is bent down, and all the shelves are destroyed. I knew then it wasn't a home invasion. This was later confirmed by the fresh bear poop in the previously locked, deadbolted front entrance. I knew it was fresh as it felt warm to my tongue. Okay, I'm joking. Who the fuck would touch or taste poo? So as the police arrived, I started piecing together what happened. A bear. A big, big, big son of a bitch got pissed off as I took away last week's garbage meal. So he smelt, well, just a few pepperoni and a half dozen beer in our fridge, in our front entrance, even though it was locked with a deadbolt. This sucker must have been massive, as we saw claw marks on the front door. Then we see the whole door frame is busted right apart. The deadbolt is still turned to lock position, but the door frame and hell, even the hinges are destroyed. The fridge didn't fare much better. So we have heard of plenty of garbage bears, as well as people getting attacked from a mama bear protecting her cubs. But nobody has heard of a bear going psycho, smashing through a metal door and deadbolt. Okay. Okay. 
So that in itself is the most amazing thing since sliced bread, all by itself. I will be the first to admit. So then shit gets stranger. We then start hearing stories from neighbours who have had sheds, garbage bins empty without garbage, but old smells, smashed to bits. Then another neighbour who was not home but in town shopping, had the front door of their house smashed open. Yep, metal door then deadbolted as well as the doorknob was also locked. So then the bear smashed the hack out of the fridge and was long gone by the time they were home. At three in the afternoon. So very odd for a bear to be doing this stuff during the day, with a paved road close by with cars driving by all day. So fast forward a few days later, I am driving home around two in the afternoon and I see by far the biggest black bear I have ever seen in my life. And I've seen dozens if not hundreds. So huge. I still wonder if it's possible to have a black grizzly. Even then it would be a large grizzly. Okay, I drive up the driveway in my car with my dog. Just a little pug. So even though he's mad, he would be about as much help as a mosquito against his goliath. So I start honking the horn, drive really close, as he's right in front of the raw metal door for our front entrance. But he just looks at me and starts pushing on the door, pissed me off. That's a new door and frame, so I drive closer, then bump into him with the bumper of my car. Not super hard, but hard enough to hurt. So he stops, then looks at me, then growls and walks away. Well... I was ready to let bygones be bygones, but this guy's an asshole. So I phone my uncle, he comes driving over with a high-powered rifle, but the bear's long gone. Okay. Now then, fast forward a couple more days, I drive home and see the new front doors destroyed. My mother was home and heard the bear smashing through the first metal door, even though by now we have no food or beer or anything on the front entryway. Yet the bastard smashed through the front door, and since there was no food, started trying to smash through the second door, also locked with a deadbolt. And I told my mother to prop a chair at night, to block the front even more. So he was smashing over and over the second door. As my mom was on the phone with her brothers, one of which started driving as fast as he could, over to save her. As he flies up the driveway, he barely stops, and jumps out and shoots the bear from about 50 feet, with a 30 odd 6 decent sized gun should be able to take down a bear easy. Anyways, he shoots it in the back. The bear just stops, turns around, and runs as fast as possible around the house, then up the hill, before he can shoot again. So this was two days ago. We've heard three more houses the bears tried to knock down the front door. But now even the conservation officers are trying to kill him, even the local RCMP. But nobody's got him yet. I've talked to various hunters, even some real old-time hunters, 80 to 90 years old. Nobody's ever heard of a bear so psycho that he would just run up to any old house in the middle of the day and just smash through one door, then attempt the next with a busy road during the day, only about 150 feet away. Update. Pretty sure my uncle shot and killed the bear yesterday. He lives a little less than one mile down the road, same as us, just hundreds of miles of mountains and forest behind his house, and a fairly busy paved road down a few hundred feet of driveway. Anyways, he saw it walking right behind his house at about three or four in the afternoon. Again, which is unusual, as he had a few people over having beers in the backyard, with music playing. This bear was not at all scared or even worried in the least about people, Anyways, he rushes the kids inside, and took a shot a few hundred feet away. But luckily one shot dropped it dead. Which is nice, at least he didn't suffer. I still feel bad when an animal has to die, but this bear would have killed a human soon if he wasn't stopped. And it most likely would have been a kid, as the kid's school bus drops him off at the road. And most have around a hundred to several hundred foot of driveway to their house. So too bad, but at least no children or anyone got hurt. 4. My dad used to tell stories at the dinner table. This is one of those spooky ones about his grandpa, my great-grandfather. 
Back to the time when it was legal smoking opium in China. My great-grandpa used to go to a smoke shop on a regular basis. He usually went there on foot by taking a shortcut. He had to walk through a graveyard. He was very familiar with every route, since he lived locally and took these paths back and forth to work every day. He could find his way while he's asleep. Or, as he believed so. One late afternoon in a winter, he felt like to take a smoke again, so he went. It was dark and cold in the woods. As usual, he took the shortcut, which is the graveyard route. Unlike every other time, he was not able to find his path to the smoke shop this time. He could not recognize where he was after a few rounds of looking for the path. He decided to go back home. The only problem in this dark and cold woods was that he could not find his way home either. Well, the grown man couldn't be lost in a place where he walked through every day, or could he? While being frustrated and a bit panicked, he saw a tiny little house with a dim light through the window. He decided to go in and ask for directions. He didn't knock as the door was halfway open. He walked in, a middle-aged, chubby lady greeted. Immediately, she sat him down and brought a pitcher of tea and a pipe. Oh, it's a new smoke shop. He was overly excited. Could it get any better? He made himself comfortable and leaned back on the bench. He began to enjoy the fog of pleasure. While he was in his little paradise, he saw the chubby lady went to the corner, where there is a mirror on the table, and started combing her hair. He could see her back and noticed she was gradually getting older and older and older. Her hair became grayer and grayer and eventually all silver white. My great-grandpa then put down the pipe and adjusted his position to sit straight. He was hoping to see through the smoke or to see if he was already too high to think right. He sat up and saw the lady combed slower and slower as it seemed it was more difficult for her to reach her own hair. She then slowly took her head off her neck and put it on the table gently, then finished combing and made a bun. My great-grandpa tried to wave away the smoke as he could not believe what he was seeing. The lady slowly put her head back onto her neck and walked back to him. She looked much, much older. Why don't you take a nap? She asked. My great-grandpa responded, it's getting late, I'll pay and be on my way. Or coppers, you can leave it on your tea stand. He rushed to take the money out of his pocket, then he completely blanked out. The next thing he knew was that he woke up on the ground. Oh, it's all a dream, he thought. He sat up and saw this tombstone next to him. Miss XX, of course. There are the coins strung on a twig in front of the tomb. Dream, not a dream. He took the money and bought some main cash, then burnt by the tomb. Side note, to those who don't know what main cash is, it's a kind of money for the dead. In China, it was very common almost everywhere. 5. Now, before I properly start this story, there are a few important details I need to point out. I am a 21-year-old Romanian male. I live in a large apartment on the third floor with three bedrooms, a large living room, and a huge kitchen made to look like an actual bar. I've been living there since I was born, and plan to continue living there until I die. My father was a really abusive man that drove my mother away around the time I started high school. She left the country and went to France where she met somebody else, but has kept in touch with me via the internet ever since and has been sending me money weekly, since my father refused to work for the most part. And when he did work, he'd just spend the little money he had on some basic food for us and on cigarettes. I've kept the money from my mother a secret from my father. I used to really despise my father, and would stay at a friend's house every day after school until 11pm, just so I wouldn't have to spend the remainder of my day with him. When I'd get home, he'd force me to socialize with him for a little. But because I always came home late, I always pretended to be tired and go to sleep. One morning in February of 2014, 
He asked me to borrow money from one of my friends to buy him a pack of cigarettes when I come home. That same day, I arrived home at 11pm like usual with his pack of cigarettes. I peeked into his room and saw he was sleeping. But that woke him up. He said something I didn't understand. I replied with, Wait a second, as I went to take my shoes off. Then I returned to his room and placed a pack of cigarettes next to his bed. That's when he opened his eyes wide, stared at me, then the ceiling, and then, grasping for air, he died in front of me then and there of a heart attack. The agreement between me and my mother is that I will continue to live here in this apartment, on my own, but she'd send money to me as usual every week until I'd finish my studies and can get a job and continue living there. I legally own this apartment in my name now. Right, so this is where my story officially begins. Fast forward to August of 2015, I was 19, and my mother and her new husband returned from France to stay with me here for a month, while on vacation before having to return to our company there. On their first day here at 8am, we all made plans for the day. I decided to go visit a friend at his workplace, while my mother and now stepfather decided to go sightseeing. Since I own an indoor cat that risks falling from the window and dying while jumping for birds outside, remember I live on the third floor, and since my parents said they'd leave later than me, I asked my mother to close all the doors in the house before leaving, and just leave my room open and the door to the balcony, which is located inside my room. Also open but to make sure the balcony windows are closed. She agreed, and I left the house to meet with my friend. I hang out with my friend until 1pm when I decided to return home. Weirdly enough, I started thinking about my dead father on the way home, and since the graveyard he was buried at was just a slight detour from my route home, I decided it was a good idea to visit. Although I hated him in life, I don't bear much resentment towards him now that he's dead. At roughly 2pm I arrived at the graveyard, spent a bit plucking the weeds around his grave, uttered a few kind words to him, and then left to head home. When I arrived home the place was awfully chilly despite it being summer, and sunny outside. The first thing that caught my eye was that the kitchen door was halfway open, and the window was wide open. I've noticed my cat on the window and instantly got mad, thinking my mom must have forgotten it open. I went into my room and noticed the balcony door was shut and locked. My cat's litter box was on the balcony, and I know how much my mom hates if the cat uses the rugs or floor as its toilet, so it made no sense for her to leave that door closed. Weird, I thought. So I called her, initially angry for putting my cat in danger. I inquired about the kitchen and balcony doors, but my mother replied with a genuinely confused tone, Huh, but we checked for all the doors to be locked, before we left the house. We specifically spent an extra five minutes closing all the doors and leaving the balcony open for the cat. Now you probably think it might have been a burglar or the wind, since all the windows in the house were open except the balcony windows. But these two theories are very easy to dismiss. Firstly, like I said before, I live on the third floor of a ten stories tall apartment building. No human can climb up there, there is absolutely no way. There's no trees or things you could grab onto. It would be like trying to climb a 9 meter, 29 feet vertical wall with no features. The only entrance to the apartment is a reinforced steel door with steel beams locking through the walls in all directions. That is impossible to open once locked. It's the type of door that you need to be extra sure you don't ever lose your keys to. Because if you do, not even the police with a battering ram can get you inside. So that leaves the burglar theory out, entirely, besides nothing was missing. As for the wind did it, well the kitchen door is a metallic sliding door, you slide it closed, it stays closed. The wind wouldn't have opened it halfway, and neither could have my cat. It's far too heavy, even if he could somehow reach for the only grip where you can pull the door from. The balcony door was closed and locked. To lock it you need to pull the handle down while it's closed. This is something only a human can do. If my mother left it open and unlocked, the wind could have closed it, but not lock it. If my mother left it open and accidentally locked it like that, 
the wind wouldn't have been able to close it. So if my mother left it open and unlocked, as she says she did, then it's very eerie to find it closed and locked. Key details I've noticed later was that the two unique pendulum clocks we have in the kitchen were both stopped at 2pm, the hour at which I visited my father's grave. When I've tried to wind them up, that's how mine work at least, you have to wind them up every few days with their special key and then swing the pendulum, I've realised they were still winded up, so somehow their gear stopped for some reason at that time. Again, this is something that can happen, but only if a human touches the pendulums and stops them from swinging. My mother and I to this day don't know what to make of it. Both her and my stepfather remember clearly shutting all the doors and leaving the balcony open. They swear they even double-checked. We've given thought about any other possibility. But there's none that makes sense. I'm not too creeped out by this, but somehow my brain still refuses to think it was anything paranormal. And even though, no matter how much I think about it, there's no rational explanation. Aside from this, there have been a few other minor incidents, such as me being in the bath and suddenly my bottle of balm falling while having a totally flat bottom. Being half full and being on a totally flat, non-slippery surface. A weird knock on my bedroom door at 2am that sounded like a coin was thrown at my door. I sleep with my bedroom door closed and locked. And a few other things, but all these I can dismiss one way or another. Nothing too strange in a bottle falling, but I live in a building complex. Maybe it was a noise from a neighbour under or above me that night. The only one that still baffles me is the doors thing. Was it my father's ghost or a glitch in the Matrix? I don't know. Hey everyone, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to 5 True Scary Subscriber Stories, episode 49. Big thanks to everybody for sending the stories in for this video. If you yourself have a story, then please do send it along to kingofthecities at gmail.com, and it will get to me, or Google Mail, that will get to me too. As always, the email is in the description of every video, uh, although it's right down at the bottom. I should probably move it nearer the top, actually, so it gets a bit more attention. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, just a quick update. I was originally going to do paranormal stories tomorrow, but I was able to get enough to do a three true scary stories. So we'll have that on Wednesday. Uh, and I think we're on schedule for the rest of the week. And uh, I'll be working like a mad Egypt, trying to get extra videos made so I can give myself a wee bit of time to relax next week. Okay, and with that I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening and take very good care of yourselves.